Church, as we continue to worship this morning, I'm going to encourage you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to 1 Samuel, specifically 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're in a series simply entitled The Life of David. We started last week. We'll be in uh, 1 Samuel for the months to come as we study David's life. We, we come now in 1 Samuel chapter 17 to arguably the, the most famous story in all of the Old Testament, the story of David and Goliath, is a story that still rings with relevance and resonance within our own culture. That there, there really is uh, very few times where there, you will not have the opportunity to, to hear people allude to this story. In March every year, you're going to have basketball announcers that when they're coming into the, 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 the beginning of March Madness and the 16 seeded small conference teams are going up against the, the big number one universities with these huge resources and five-star recruits and you're going to have NCAA announcers that dust off their Old Testament illusions and say, we've got, a, we've got a David versus Goliath here. Every five years or so, they're going to be in the, the boxing arena. There's going to be sort of another reiteration of, of, of Rocky Balboa, underdog, unsung, unknown, going up against the, the, the Apollo Creed, going up against the heavyweight champion. And, and there those boxing announcers are going to dust off the Old Testament illusion and say, we got a David versus Goliath. You've had for decades now in, in every small town, big box stores that move in into the outskirts. And then you've got this coalition of downtown uh, business owners that, that go to city council and, and they're sort of saying, this is what's going to happen to our downtown. We let these, you know, let these big giants in. And so you've got a David versus Goliath. It, it just repeats itself. It's an apt illustration and illusion for a lot of these underdog kinds of stories. There's something about an underdog that we enjoy. There's something about an underdog that captures our imagination and it captures our heart. But what if I told you that maybe we have misread this story? We think of the David and Goliath story as clearly David being the underdog. But, but what, if, what if I told you that when we listen closely to this story, David, my friends, was never the underdog. It was always Goliath. You hear the word of the Lord in 1 Samuel chapter 17, starting in verse 2 and following. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah. And drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side. And Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. With a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. Whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of a bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And a shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. The Philistines and Israelites are our rivals. We've seen this battle coming. We've, we've already seen skirmishes all throughout the conquest of the land. When you, when you go back to the story of Exodus and you have God setting the people free from Egyptian captivity and they wander in the wilderness and he's leading, God is the, the people of God to the promised land. Well, the promised land had inhabitants. The promised land had an indigenous people that were native to the land and that's the Philistines. So surprise, surprise, they don't like the Israelites and the Israelites don't like them. 
They have skirmishes and battles. You go back three chapters before this in 1 Samuel chapter 14, and guess what you find? The Philistines who, who have outnumbered and outmatched the Israelites. It seems as if in 1 Samuel chapter 14, the Israelites are bound to destruction and, and maybe even annihilation. And what happens? God fights for the Israelites, sends an earthquake. And in the midst of the earthquake, the Philistines are confused. They withdraw, they regroup, they re-strategize, and they say what would have been a popular strategy then in that ancient Near Eastern world, to, world to, to be able to have a representative from your people going up against a representative from the other people, and winner takes all. And boy, do the Philistines have one who can fight their battles. Verse 4 of chapter 17 tells us Goliath was six cubits in a span. That is, Goliath is coming in at nine feet six inches. Uh, Goliath is nine foot six. That, that's a big man is what that is. Look, look with me at your Bible. I want you to look really closely here. Look at the very end of verse 4. Do you see a, a footnote there at the end of verse 4? In the ESV, you're going to see this in most, if not all, modern translations. You're going to see a footnote. Let's look at the footnotes here. Go to the bottom. Most of you are going to have a 2 at the end of verse 4. That's a footnote. Go to the very bottom of your Bible. And what do you see at the bottom of your Bible at that footnote? You're going to see three descriptions. You're going to see LXX. Do you know what LXX stands for? That is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. That's called the Septuagint. LXX. Next to LXX, you're going to see in your Bible, Dead Sea Scroll. And then next to that, you're going to see Josephus. Do you see where I'm talking in your Bible? Do you see that footnote there? And next to Septuagint, next to Dead Sea Scroll, next to Josephus, you're going to have a four. Let's talk about that for a second. Here's a place where, where some manuscripts have that Goliath was nine foot six. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are, uh, were are extant manuscripts that were found in 1948 in the region of the Dead Sea, they have a, a scribal difference, and they have four. So Goliath for the Dead Sea Scrolls and also in Josephus and also in the uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible have Goliath coming in at six foot nine instead of nine six. This is important and it helps us because we need to understand how to read our Bible. Some people outside of the faith use this to sort of weaponize that you can't trust the Bible. Of course we can trust the Bible. Of course we can trust the Bible. But we need to understand how we receive the Bible. In 1609, there wasn't someone walking around in the forest in England who received from the heavens the King James Bible that dropped to the ground and picked it up. That's not how we received our Bible. We receive our Bible through scribal copies and manuscripts. You cannot go to the Smithsonian. You cannot go to Israel and find the original manuscript of 1 Samuel. But we have thousands, thousands of copies, thousands of manuscripts. And in small percentages, there are some discrepancies. And sometimes they're around numbers like this. Either way, a Hebrew man in that time, the average height is 5'5". David, we know from the last chapter, David's the youngest and he's the smallest. So let's just say we've got David coming in at 5'2". He's going up against 9'6 or 6'9". Either way here, we've got a Kevin Hart going up against a Shaquille O'Neal is what we have here. <laughs> the, the, the story's not changed. Here's a Goliath of a man going up to, to someone in all standards would be an unimpressive and unlikely of one who is going to be the foe here. Now, he's impressive, Goliath is. We'll get to heaven and we'll figure out exactly 9 6 or 6 9 here. This we know is impressive. Armor makes any gladiator envious. His armor alone, 175, 200 pounds that he's carrying around with him. He's got a bronze helmet, bronze leggings, bronze javelin, a spear here. Spear alone, he's got 20 to 25 pounds in this spear. He's got all this impressive protection, and he's got a bodyguard that goes before him, sort of a hype man that is going before him here. Goliath is screaming out these taunts twice a day, 40 days. This Philistine was stomped down into the valley, taunt the Israelites with verse 8 and verse 9. Why have you come out to draw up battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? 
choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. The Philistines will be the Israelite servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. Goliath is calling out to the Israelites, and the Israelites have one natural candidate to fight him, and his name is certainly not David. What's his name? Saul. Saul was central casting. Central casting. Comes straight from it to be the Israelite leader. He's taller, broad shoulders, star quarterback. It's everything you want in a leader. You get in Saul, the Israelites certainly say, well, we've got our man. This guy, Saul, now listen to how Saul receives his kind of nomination from within to go fight Goliath. Verse 11, chapter 17, when Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, understatement, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. David shows up on the scene, unlikely that he's even there, he's holding down two jobs. Now, chapter 16, last time we were together, Samuel the prophet has privately anointed David, but he's not been publicly recognized. Saul is still the leader here. David's holding down two jobs. He's still a shepherd for his dad, Jesse, and he's moonlighting, playing the harp to be able to ease sort of the psychological torment that Saul is going through. Saul is going through these depressive bouts, and there's something about David's soothing musicianship calms him and allows him to sleep. So Jesse, for all practical purposes, gives David a job, and that job is to get food to his brothers. So David functions kind of as an Uber Eats that goes out to, 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 to get the food right there to the front line. And as he walks upon the scene, he hears, he hears this giant who is taunting his own people here. And from the distance, as he gets closer, notice how David responds. The Israelites respond. Saul responds with, with dismay, and they're greatly fear, they're grateful, uh, greatly afraid. Verse 26 of chapter 17, David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills that guy, this Philistine, and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is that guy? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Saul's given out prizes for whatever man can step up and step out and slay the giant, he would receive uh, monetary wealth, but also receive in marriage Saul's own daughter. David says, I'm the man. I volunteer to be the tribute. I, I step out. I'm going to step up to fight Goliath. David hears his eagerness and sort of laughs. Of course not you, David. It would be a suicide mission. David says, not so fast, Saul. I have my resume of what God has done in me and through me against, well, against rivals. And notice what he says in verse 37 is he says to Saul, don't you underestimate what God has done in my life before. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hands of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. As Saul is sending him out, he sends him out, not unequipped. He pulls out his armor, pulls out his helmet, and he puts his breastplate over David, puts his helmet on David, and David ends up looking like an 11-year-old, 12-year-old son of an NFL offensive lineman who's trying to wear the, the helmet of his dad, and the helmet uh, uh, stoops over his eyes, and he can't see, and his shoulder pads swallow his son. He can't wear him, and so David, he takes it all off. He says, I'm going to fight this giant. Goliath sees him from a distance, and Goliath's words are found in verse 43. Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? David, in his mind, is not a match. Translation, you've got to be kidding me. David reaches down. We know this part of the story. There's probably not been a part of any Bible story that has been more 
etched in the hearts of vacation Bible school attendees and Sunday school attendees. And you, some of you have flannel graph images from, from decades ago of seeing this story. The story of David stooping down, slingshot in one hand, picking up five smooth stones. And he says this to the giant in verse 45. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. That, my friends, is God-centered trash talking. That's what that is. And I will give the dead bodies of the hosts of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves. And the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Slingshot in one hand, the smooth stone, Clings through the air, lodges in the forehead of the giant. The giant wobbles, his knees begin to buckle, and down goes the giant. Armorless David, inexperienced David, cute little kid David, Jesse's youngest son, goes over, pulls out the giant's own sword, and cuts his head off. He's not just going to stun this giant. He's not just going to knock him unconscious. He will slay the giant. And David wins. Israel wins. But who really won? You see, what David has hinted at this entire time, what David has taunted the the giant with is, is that ultimately it is God who wins. And as God wins, so Israel wins. And so as Israel wins, so David wins. Notice how David won, not through his ingenuity. He he doesn't inquire about Goliath's weaknesses with Saul. He doesn't strategize with the rest of the Israelites, considering the weight of the spear, the size of the shield here. What he focuses on isn't Goliath, but he focuses on what is and who is on his side in the battle. What's bigger than Goliath in this story? David's trust in God is bigger. And this is an important truth for us. Do you notice in this passage just how many times God's name is on the lips of David? I mean, we can count them. Let's just go back to the story here and you look in your copy of God's word. We see nine references. Verse 26, the armies of the living God. Verse 36, the armies of the living God. Verse 45, the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Verse 46, the Lord will deliver you into my hand that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Verse 47, the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Counting them up nine times. On the lips of David, we got Goliath twice. Nine to two, four times more is David fixated and focused upon God here. David's strength comes from his focus on God. He's not paralyzed by fear. He's not immobilized by the size of the giant that is before him. And here is a path. How do you face the Goliath of life? Well, David gives us, well, he gives us a mathematical equation is what he gives us. He gives us a way for us to face the giants that roam in our world today. And, of course, they're not six, nine, nine, six giants They most likely are going to be taunting you at the restaurant that you go to at the end of the service here. But but, uh, giants are real. And and giants are bullies. And giants taunt. And giants will paralyze all of us in this room with fear. Because they don't schedule, they don't coordinate. They they come and they come sometimes as a surprise. And and we've got to be honest here. We, We are no match. We're no match. You're no match when you come up and face a giant in life. And that giant comes again in a lot of different forms. Sometimes it's 
the consultation that you have with the doctor after the regularly scheduled appointment and you hear uh, uh, this, this dire diagnosis and just six minutes ago, you were planning what the next six months would look like and you realize in that moment everything is about to change. And there's a giant taunting. There are some 15-year-olds and 16 and 17-year-olds that are trying to walk the narrow road, trying to follow Christ with integrity at school. And you hear the taunts. You hear the call. You hear the pull come this way. Why are you going that way? Some of you in the workplace know what, exactly what it's like to, to try to live a life of integrity, to, to walk a road of actual character, and you, you feel this current that pulls you. It pulls you to this broad road. It, it pulls you to a place of compromise, and, and you know exactly how difficult it is as, as you hear the, the taunt of the, of, of the Goliaths of your life calling you to fix your focus upon them. Or maybe you're a mom or a dad here in the sanctuary. Maybe you're a grandparent here in the sanctuary, and you know what it is to have a son or a daughter or a grandchild that is living in a foreign land, and you've been praying for weeks and months and years for them to come back, and it feels as if there's just this giant obstacle of unbelief that will not unleash the grip from the child or grandchild that you love so dearly. I mean, giants still roam. Don't be misled. In life, you will have more than you can handle. But God will never give you more than he can handle. And this is the story of David. Uh, do, do you understand that every time a giant roams into your zip code, the zip code of your heart and the zip code of your soul, that it is an opportunity for you to choose, am I going to ponder God's promises four times more than I ponder the perils that are before me? Every time a giant intersects your life, it's an opportunity for you to ponder, am I, going to, am I going to focus upon his grace four times more than I do the guilt that is in me and the guilt that is around me? Every time that you come to a giant, it is an invitation for you to say, who are you focusing upon? Who has your heart? Is it, the, is it the giant that is before you or is it the God that is inside of you? Will you live a Goliath? fixated life or a God-focused life. David shows us a way that the greatness of our God is always, always far greater than the greatness of the Goliaths that are before us. David has five smooth stones and we have some stones. We have the spirit of God that dwells in us that reminds us of the peace that passes all understanding no matter what we are facing. We have the community of God that is with us no matter where we are. We have the word of God that is before us that, that remind us of his promises and remind us of his truth. When the world is screaming and taunting, we have prayer before God as we listen to him and commune with him and ask him for his wisdom and his strength. We have the grace of God grace of God that fuels us in the battles of life as the Goliaths, they do still taunt. And they're bullies that demand our attention and they produce fear. But you can always, Christian, have the opportunity in the face of a giant to trust God and to serve God because you can reminded, be reminded that God has slain the ultimate giant. David and Goliath have a wonderful story. But it's not the final story. David and Goliath is a story that points beyond itself. David and Goliath points us to another battle where in one corner we have Satan himself with his minions that are taunting. In the other corner we have none other than the Son of God, Jesus himself. And they will go to do battle. 
And on Friday, it seems as if the unthinkable and unimaginable has occurred, that Jesus has been slain by this enemy, has, has, been, uh, has, has died under his hand. But here we have not a smooth stone that would be hurled through the air, but we have a stone that will be rolled away on Sunday. And that stone that is rolled away forever and again reminds us that the, that the Goliath of Satan has been defeated, the Goliath of death has been defeated, that the Goliath of hell itself has no power over any of us that are in Christ Jesus because he has won the victory. And so we can say with the Apostle Paul, death, where is thy sting? Oh, death, where is thy victory? And we are able to say that, Christian, no matter the size of the Goliaths that are before you, taunting you, haunting you, because God is greater than all of our Goliaths. We gather to be reminded of a central truth for all of us who are in Christ. Jesus slayed the ultimate giant, so you, we, can courageously face all of life's lesser giants. Amen.